Well, praise the Lord, everyone. It's another edition here at 153greatfish.website. We're going to continue our series on Revelation. And uh, just to let you know that uh, there is some streaming problems today. So if you don't catch it or if it seems to kind of miss a beat, you'll want to come back to the archive and play the, uh, the YouTube video. Let's pray. Jesus, we praise you, Lord. We, we bless your name, God. You are worthy, Lord, to open the seals. We praise you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. So, on we go. Under the altar is the study today. Under the altar. And what we're going to talk about today is the fifth seal and the sixth seal that's coming off the scroll that Jesus unloosed. Now, remember, Jesus was the only one worthy to open the scroll. This is his church, and this is his gift to us to show us what's going to transpire in the future. Here's the outline today. Just to review, seals one through four we've proven were Islam. Now the black horse is fading. It appears to be ISIS being sort of defeated, but giving way to the green horse riding. We know that all four horses ride together to destroy one-fourth of the world to take them to death and to hell. It should be noted that one-fourth of the world is Muslim, and it's my belief that that religion is taking these people to the wrong place. You need to find the Acts 2.38 plan of salvation, and that will help you to come into the faith. Then we want to review that Revelation is a three-act drama when a turning point brings the story from the beginning to the middle of the drama. We need to pay attention, and here's a recall with three L's. A turning point uses conflict. A turning point uses conflict. We're going to find out what that turning point is today that takes us from the beginning of the drama, that's seals one through four, to the middle of the drama, which is seals five and six. So seals five and six represent the oppression by Antichrist of the true Jesus church. Now, many people think that the Antichrist will be one person, uh, in fact, uh, John said there are many antichrists. So it seems to be both a person and it seems to be a system of values. Okay. And uh, it marks people in their forehead and their hand. So the values that you hold marks you. So if you've bought into the modern values uh, of, uh, of uh, civil rights uh, versus uh, moral rights, you have bought into a value system that is not after God. Let's move on. Seal number five. When I say civil rights, I am talking about civil wrongs. Seal five. Revelation 6, 9 through 11 breaks open the seal. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony of them that, uh, and for the testimony which they held. They cried, here's the loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, Dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them. It was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants and brethren should be killed and fulfilled. Now, this last phrase here, they should rest for a little season until their fellow servants are martyred. Now, it would appear to me that the, this uh, sort of persecution is a memorial to those people who have been persecuted in the past. Now, I'm going to go through some of that today, uh, but there is a future persecution coming. In fact, it seems to be here already. Let's keep going. So there's two reasons for the persecution madness that's coming on the planet. In fact, we see it here in the popular press. Recently, ABC News declared that Christianity, according to this Alliance Defense Fund, which uh, defends uh, uh, religious freedom, that they are a hate group. That's ABC News. Listen, we know that Bob Iger, the chairman of uh, Walt Disney, of uh, Walt Disney, owns ABC, owns ESPN. That he is extremely far left, and uh, I can't explain why his group has such hatred for Christianity. I don't know if he personally does, but it would be an interesting question to ask him. One, here's the two reasons for persecution madness. Number one, preaching the word of God. You want to get people upset. Preach the truth to them. Preach the word. People don't study their Bibles anymore. They think they, they invent their religion with their own value system. 
they become God. And two, preaching your personal testimony. When you give your personal testimony about how God has saved you, delivered you, God has filled you with his Holy Spirit, when you give that, that upsets the devil. And there is persecution for those two things. So note that blood, okay, when it says that, that their blood is poured under the altar, that blood is not just used to touch the horns of the altar or to cover the mercy seat in the Holy of Holies. It is also poured under the altar. You can read about that in Leviticus 4, 7. Recall that the altar it's talking about is the altar of sacrifice, the brazen altar where Old Testament sense, the animals were brought there to be burned and the blood was touched upon the four horns of that particular altar. And then of course it was brought into the holy place and then into the Holy of Holies to be offered once a year upon the mercy seat. Okay, Leviticus 4, 7 will give you a better idea of that. And this is a, uh, again, an allusion to the Old Testament, a metaphor. So here's the blood of the alt under the altar question. So this is what the voice of the blood cries out and asks, how long, Lord, until you avenge our deaths? That's a question that they ask, how long? And the answer is a little season until your fellow Christians are killed. That's the answer that God gives them. That tells me that this is actually a memorial to all Christians who have died, uh, who have been persecuted, who have died for their faith in Jesus Christ, for preaching the word and their personal testimonies. I want to go through a few of those uh, uh, people who have died for their faith in Jesus Christ today. So here you'll see at the end time, you'll see that the, the blood of the saints will be poured out. We see what's going on here with ISIS cutting people's heads off, slicing them off, getting ready to execute them. Uh, of course, we know that ISIS went after all the Christians in Mosul and uh, then just started to proceed against anybody who disagreed with them. If it's a, a Jew or a Christian, a so-called uh, infidel, or it's a Muslim who is not strict enough, you're going to lose your head with this group, although they seem to be getting defeated right now, giving way to the green horse riding the uh, Shias of Iran and Iraq. Seal number five, we're still talking about that. I want to talk about some of the people that have been martyred in the past. Many of you don't know about the Yellow Cross, but the Catholic Church during the Inquisition, which began in the late 12th century, uh, especially 1208, they required people who had been heretics, that, uh, who had, who had uh, confessed that they were wrong, that they still mark them with a Yellow Cross. Okay, you all are familiar with the yellow star that was put on the Jews by the Germans. This idea of marking somebody began with the Muslims when they would mark infidels with a symbol that then was uh, picked up by the Catholics when they began marking people they disagreed with with the yellow cross after they had uh, confessed that they were wrong. If they could get you to do that. And then uh, the yellow cross was used to uh, identify people known as the Cathars. Okay, the Cathars. So in the Pyrenee Mountains, which uh, many of you haven't looked at in a map, is because we don't really care about it here in, in North America. These are the mountain, this is the mountain range that divides uh, uh, France and Spain. And uh, the reason it's important is that there was a group of people that lived there between, uh, well, long before 1208 to 1308, but they got persecuted during that 100-year period. And it's called the region of Languedoc. Now that French word means the region of languages. 200,000 Cathari, that word Cathari comes from the Greek Katharos, which means pure ones, holy ones. 200,000 Cathari people were murdered and burned at the stake by the French Catholics. This pogrom was begun by Pope Innocent III. Uh, it's also known as the Albigensian uh, Crusade. So he initiated this great inquisition, which lasted until 1869. The last part of the uh, inquisition uh, was in South America. So it began in 1208 by Pope Innocent III. Now the, in the Inquisition was actually an organization. It was organized by the Dominicans. Uh, Dominic Guzman was the one who uh, started it and he was the first Dominican uh, monk and that order uh, orchestrated and administered the, the Inquisition. They then began to write about how to torture people into confessions and they had instruments to get you to confess. It was very brutal. It's, it's as brutal as ISIS. Uh, the Inquisition. They, uh, they uh, uh, how do I say it? 
they wanted to get rid of the Cathars in southern France. And the way that they did it was they told the uh, northern princes of, of uh, France that they could have all the land and the money that the Cathars had. And so the first city that they besieged was in 1208, the city of Bézier. Bézier, they marched out 20,000 people after besieging the city executed them and burned them, murdered and burned them. There was not one person left alive, about 20,000 people. This pogrom continued for 100 years until about 200,000 Cathars were executed. Now, Cathars, uh, we're going to learn a little bit more about them. I'll give you a website. You can investigate it. So anyway, they were forced to convert back to Catholicism under torture. Of course, the first part of this crusade, they didn't allow anybody to convert. They just killed everybody. And uh, the phrase, uh, God knows his own, kill them all. So that, was, that came out of this uh, crusade by a man named uh, uh, Montfort. So no writings of the Perfecti. Now a Perfecti was a pastor that was a leader of a cell group of Cathars. These were the leaders. No writings of the Perfecti, uh, also called the good Christians or the good men. Uh, none of these survive. Only the polemics by the Catholic persecutors survive. So we don't really know what these people believe. So if you go to a website and they say, this is what the Cathars believed, remember, those are the writings of the people that conquered them, of the Catholics who hated them. So in the Cathari cities, and there were many of them in southern France, heretics were murdered or burned at the stake. This is also known as the Albigensian Crusade. It was a state-sanctioned persecution. The French kings had to give permission, but a lot of the uh, leaders of, the, uh, of those feudal lands did not agree with it, and there was resistance, okay? Albi is a city in southern France. Here you'll see the Jewish star that was propagated by the Nazis, but this is what the Catholics did. They had the same thing, only it was worn on your clothes. It was a yellow star or excuse me, a yellow cross. Here's the map of the Languedoc region, and I'm going to show you some of the key cities. The Albis, that's where you get the word Albigensian, Montauban, Toulouse, uh, Béziers, where the 20,000 were murdered, and all these cities, Foy, and uh, many of them are famous for having either castles or cities where this crusade occurred over 100 years. It's estimated they killed, the Catholics killed 200,000 people that didn't believe in their version of Christianity. And we don't really know what they believe, but we do know that they were called the Cathar, the pure ones, the holy ones. It's in the, langu uh, the area of languages. Uh, I'm not sure if that me meant it was an area of speaking in tongues or what it was. Carcassonne was another area, another city. Now you can still travel to these places and these castles and uh, old ancient cities are still around. And you can probably get a get an idea uh, from a vacation there. Uh, they have a, a recreation, reenactments of the uh, persecutions. Uh, it would be it would be a worthwhile vacation just to let you know. Here's one of the cities, or excuse me, one of the castles of the Cathars that's still there. Look at the mountainous region here. This is a rough country. This was not an easy country to conquer. They would use the trebuchet, and they would uh, basically break down the walls with the catapults. To begin with, cut off their access to water, starve them out, and then when they came out, let them take nothing. Then whoever the invaders were, you basically got to uh, pick up all the assets. And that's exactly what the Nazis did to the Jews, is that uh, you had to mark your house with the Star of David, that you were a Jew. You had to wear it on your clothing. And in the final persecution, when they rounded them up in ghettos, you got to keep their assets uh, their artwork, their money, whatever else you could uh, find by conquering them. And then, of course, here we see somebody being burned at the stake. This was common. And I want to talk about a few people that suffered uh, this heinous crime. And uh, there's a website for you to read more about the Cathars, cathar.info. You might want to write that down. Just remember that anything about their belief system was created by the Catholic persecutors. This is not necessarily what they believe. We really don't know. So, the Great Tribulation is also found in Seal 5. So, the Cathars, the Albigensi Crusades, like I said, I talked about that. The Catholic princes were given indulgences if they participated in the crusade. <laughs> and they were given all their assets. Now, here's some other people that were burned at the stake or persecuted. John Wycliffe, the, the, the Lollard, 1380 AD. 
the Catholic bishops of England, rose up against his polemic against church wealth. Churches had accumulated a lot of wealth. Uh, he came against transubstantiation. That's where you believe that the wafer that you eat at uh, communion is, in fact, the real body and blood of Jesus Christ. He uh, came against celibacy, purgatory, monasticism, and indulgences. It's no wonder the Catholics hated him. These are all doctrines that they still uh, maintain, with the exception of indulgences. They got rid of that one because it created the, uh, the Lutheran Reformation in Europe in uh, 15, uh, 1525 to 30 or so. Now, he also translated the Latin Bible to English. That infuriated them. They didn't want anybody to be able to read that Bible on their own in the vulgar tongue. But, of course, the Latin translation was not a very good translation. The Vulgate, Pope Martin V, then authorized the exhuming of Wycliffe's body out of his grave, and they burned his bones. That's how much they hated him. I think they did this around 1413 or so, right before this man, John Huss of Czech, was burned at the stake. Uh, he was uh, promised by the Holy Roman Emperor a safe passage to Lake Constance. Constance is a lake also called Bodensee over there in Germany. It separates Switzerland from Germany, on the southern Germany. They had a Catholic council there going on, and he was invited to come and debate his beliefs, which were identical to Wycliffe's. Wycliffe was John Huss's hero, and he was from Prague in Czech Republic. And when they got there, when he got there, they arrested him, didn't allow him to debate. They had a show trial and kept him in a dungeon until his health failed. And then they burned him at the stake. Now, when they burned him, they put straw around him, which uh, wasn't very good at killing you. And so uh, he was grateful to a woman who then brought some wood to get the job done. And uh, then uh, they finished uh, executing him that way. Then William Tyndale himself, who was executed by Henry VIII in October of 1536. First, he was strangled at the stake for what? What was his crime? He translated the Bible into the vulgar tongue, English. He was strangled at the stake, then he was burned. And uh, he had condemned Henry's marriage to Anne Boleyn, and he had repudiated this doctrine of praying to saints, along with most of the ones that uh, Wycliffe had repudiated as well. And uh, he was betrayed, captured, uh, they hunted him down in, in the Netherlands and then brought him back to be executed. And then there's Michael Cervetus, okay, the Spaniard, uh, probably one of the smartest men that's ever lived. And uh, he, was a, he was a physician, discovered the cardiovascular system, how the lungs uh, uh, cleanse the blood. He was burned at the stake by a Protestant named John Calvin. And, of course, Calvin did this, conducted a show trail, very much like they did with uh, Tyndale and John Huss, 1553. And uh, what's funny about this is that Calvin himself had been hunted by the Catholic Church and uh, had survived in the uh, free states of Switzerland, Geneva. And then when he caught Michael Servetus, he had him executed. Why? Because Servetus took Calvin's book, The Christian Institutes, and marked it up and showed Calvin, where he was wrong on all of his doctrines, like predestination and tulip and all that. Servetus knew clearly that uh, Calvin had created the monstrous god of predestination. Uh, Calvin was completely uh, subdued by the writings of Augustine. So those are some of the people that were uh, persecuted. And those are the ones that are waiting with white robes for their fellow Christians to be killed. Now, Seal 6 talks about the day of flagration, conflagration. We, we talked about that in an earlier uh, uh, teaching, 2 of 12 here. And it says in Revelation 6, 12 through 17, I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake. The sun became black, a sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. The stars of heaven fell into the earth, even as a fig tree casts her untimely figs when she is shook by a mighty wind. The heaven departed as a scroll when it's rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. Hide us, the people said, the, the elites, the people with money who are buying condos and uh, missile silos, etc., hiding in New Zealand. They said, hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath, this is key, the great day of his wrath has arrived, and who shall be able to stand? So this is a great day. Now, many people, when they see the day of the Lord or the great day of his wrath, etc., it can be confused because there's over 29 direct references to the day of the Lord in both the Old and New Testament. So the day of conflagration, as we've learned in the second lesson, is a great persecution 
and tribulation. And this great tribulation is followed by the wrath of the Lamb. So after the persecution of the fellow saints who are going to be killed, the wrath of the Lamb is, uh, how do I say it? It's uh, invigorated by this persecution. Jesus gets upset. He stands up like he did when he saw Stephen being stoned. He's upset here. So the heavenly shaking, the falling stars, the blood moons, the eclipses of the sun, these are a sign signifying the intervention of God in the affairs surrounding his church. Now in reality, what's going on here is the rapture, the rapture precedes the wrath. And you're going to see that here. Uh, but there's also something else that precedes the wrath. And, and we're going to talk about that at the end of this study. So the great day of the Lord is not the days of vengeance visit upon Israel and the temple that we read about in Luke 21, 22. These, the day of the Lord is found several times in the Old Testament when he judges Israel, when he uh, judges the nations that have come against Israel at various times. And so when God picks up his sword and starts executing wrath, that's called the day of the Lord. Okay, you got it? So here's Isaiah 61, 1 through 2. This is a very famous passage, all of us remember from Jesus quoting it. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn. Now when Jesus quotes it, he leaves off this phrase, day of vengeance. So he says this in Luke 4, 18 through 19. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me <clears throat> to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. What's missing is the day of vengeance. And of course, this day of vengeance is related to this uh, day of conflagration, the, the, uh, the wrath of the Lamb. So, we have a couple days of the Lord. There's one, here's one, the judgment on Jerusalem and Israel's persecutors. That's referred to in the Old Testament. This happens multiple times, the day of the Lord. Then there's this one great day. This is the day of vengeance on the church's persecutors in the end time. The day of the Lord is, uh, as I said, quoted 29 times. That phrase is found in the Bible, Old and New. So let's look at the uh, day of the Lord as it relates to vengeance on the church persecutors during the tribulation period. So the sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood, before the great and terrible day of the Lord arrives. That's found in Joel 2.21, which is basically quoting what we just read in Revelation. Uh, Joel 3.14, multitude, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. Now that is a reference to Armageddon. There's another day of the Lord there. And so Amos says, Woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord, <clears throat> for what end is it to you? The day of the Lord is darkness and not light. He's criticizing people that are earnestly hoping for the day of the Lord. This is a bad time. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's darkness, not light. Malachi says this, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Now, many people think that Elijah himself will personally appear, but uh, Jesus said that John the Baptist was Elijah. The spirit of Elijah is to declare repentance. And so repentance will be declared in Israel before the great and dreadful day of the wrath of the Lamb. And then again, uh, we see here that uh, Luke and, uh, and Peter are quoting Joel 2.31, the sun shall be turned into darkness and went into blood before the great, and then they use this word in the Greek, notable day of the Lord arrives. This is a direct quotation of Joel 2.31, which means that this day is in the future. It's in the Revelation, where we're reading right here. It's the uh, sixth seal. So it says this, there's a coming great and terrible day of the Lord. The sun will be darkened, the moon will be blood red. I think we're seeing some of these things happening right now. And then we see the conflagration found in 2 Peter 3.10, talking about the, the, the heavens will be, will be rolled away or rolled up like a scroll. There's going to be this judgment that comes that even the elites can't hide in a bunker. This judgment, when it comes, it's going to get everything. Okay, There is no hiding place. You need to come into the faith of Jesus Christ, that Acts 2.38 uh, covenant, before this occurs. So, the conflagration will be delayed. <laughs> that's another thing that's going to happen here in Revelation. Let's read about it. After these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. Now, the reason they're holding the four winds is to stop the judgment. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. He cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea. See, that's their mission, but they're hold, held up here. They're holding the four winds, but it's given to them to hurt the earth and the sea. That's the conflagration. But we see a delay. 
And uh, this angel in the east says, Hurt not the earth, nor the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And so we see that what's going on here is that uh, there's going to be a, uh, um, a uh, withholding of judgment just for a short time. Well, what goes on during the withholding of this? A end time revival and the rapture of the church. That's what's going to be happening. So the winds are withheld, as we said, until the end time revival commences and seals the real messianic Jews. So <clears throat> who are the real messianic Jews? They're the 144,000 from the 12 tribes. This is a symbolic number of Jews that enter the Acts 238 church. This is the remnant that comes out of Babylon. And to me, Babylon represents the Talmud <clears throat> and the false doctrine of the Trinity. No two things could be more false than those two things. That's all Babylonian, okay? Come out from them and be separate, it says in Revelation 18.4. Come out of Babylon. Babylon is also a system. It's called the false church. Uh, this doctrine of the Trinity has, uh, was invented by the philosophers that entered in the church in the, in the third century, second, third century. Come out of that. Come into the Acts 2.38 gospel. There's only one, one God. His name is Jesus. So then we see the worship scene in Revelation 7. It's a scene of the raptured church with palms in their hands. This is a symbol. The palms are always a symbol of the Feast of Tabernacles. And, of course, these are the ones that come out of Great Tribulation of Seal 5. And there's myriads of them. Literally, these are all the persecuted saints of the Great Tribulation. So it says, it says to here in Revelation 7, And one of the elders asked me, Who are these, these great multitudes, the myriads, which are arrayed in white robes? Where do they come from? So those are the two questions the elder asks John, and John says this, I don't know. And the elder said to me, These are they which have come out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. I believe that this is the rapture of the dead in Christ and the living in Christ. And so this is people that have been martyred throughout all time. All of them had great tribulation. Every Christian that's going to walk upright and live holy will have great tribulation. We will be persecuted by former family and friends. We will be persecuted by people that leave the church. We'll be persecuted by governments that want to uh, uh, make somebody else happy. Uh, there's persecution as part of being a Christian. And that's why Jesus gives us white robes. That's where we'll stop and uh, today. And uh, so I wanted to show you seals uh, five and six. And then next time we'll progress to the great seal, seal seven, and what the, uh, the Bible has to say about what's going to go on there. I hope you're enjoying these. Tell your friends, uh, forward these videos, uh, if you can, to uh, your email list. And we'll see you next time here on 153greatfish.website.